So hello everyone. Today we're going to be presenting a Poultry Farmer's Guide to FSA Loans. We hope that in this guide you'll learn uh, the basics that you need to know in order to navigate your way through the FSA loan process. So some of the things we'd like you to take away today are a better understanding of the FSA financing options available to you, a better understanding of how that financing works and what elements uh, make the determinations at FSA, um, some of the factors you should consider before borrowing for a poultry farm, a better understanding of the risks in financing a poultry farm, a uh, better understanding of the FSA eligibility process, a better relationship with your local FSA office, and overall, uh, more confidence in your ability to successfully manage your farm. So uh, this workshop is broken up into three sections. Section one will be a personal evaluation. Uh, things that you need to ask yourself personally before borrowing for a poultry farm. Section 2 will cover an introduction to uh, FSA loan programs. So we'll just talk about eligibility in general, types of loans, types of FSA lenders, things like that. And then Section 3 will be the application process where we go through applying for a loan, approval and denial of a loan, repealing a loan, and then restructuring a loan. So the first thing you need to do before borrowing to finance your poultry operation are to set your goals and to ask your big questions. So as a family, sit down and write out your goals, discuss them, make sure that everyone is voicing their opinions, prioritize your goals. Um, remember that overall this is a family farm, a family operation, so your, the well-being of your family is the most important thing. Um, think about is this business a good, time, a good use of your time and resources? Um, do you have the money, time, knowledge to make this business work? And uh, does this specific financing package work for you? The uh, price of the mortgage note, your payment that you're going to have to make, the terms, the interest rate, everything like that. So just remember that uh, you're responsible for considering all these questions before you uh, apply for any type of financing. So, uh, as an introduction to farm loans, we have two basic types of loans. We have an operating loan and an ownership loan. Now, there are other types of loans, but we're just going to kind of talk about these because these are the primary uh, types of loans that most farmers need. An operating loan is a short-term loan to purchase inputs necessary to operate your farm, while an ownership loan is a longer-term loan made for the purchase of major farming assets like farmland, poultry houses, or equipment. Within FSA, you have two types of uh, loans. You have a direct loan. That's a loan made by FSA to farmers where FSA is the lender and also services the loan. And then you have a guaranteed loan. Now, that's a loan made by a financial institution like a bank or something of that nature, which is backed by FSA. So in that scenario, your lending institution is the one servicing the loan. Uh, typically, that'll be someone like Farm Credit, for example. Uh, whereas FSA will financially guarantee the loan up to 90%. So just to understand the risk, that's very important to do so before you apply for a loan. And understanding the steps of evaluation are good because the process by which your loan will be evaluated is different from what you need to do personally. So in a loan evaluation, they'll look at eligibility. Do you qualify for the loan? They'll look at feasibility. Does your loan repayment plan make sense? Will that farm loan cash flow? And then they look at your collateral. How much collateral you have, how much you are offering. Your collateral can be real estate, farms, uh, equipment, things of that nature. You know, But they'll look at the total package that you're bringing in. But things that you need to ask yourself are, how well do you really know the poultry business? Have you talked to any current or former poultry farmers? What will happen if you can't make that loan payment? How consistent is your pay as a grower? And then does your contract, the contract with your integrator, have any type of language that you really need to be aware of? Um, because your mortgage is a binding contract, so you want to ensure to look at the contract from your integrator as well. So we'll talk about collateral first and what happens is if you default. Collateral we define as an asset offered as security for the repayment of a loan to be forfeited in the event of a default. So typically, collateral used for farm loans include farms, farming equipment, vehicles, 
land, or your personal home. So in this scenario, a default is a failure to fulfill a loan obligation, especially to repay a loan. That's something known as a monetary obligation, and therefore if you do not repay your loan, you're in monetary default. Um, now you can be in non-monetary default, and that is where you fail to comply with a provision of the loan that is not related to repayment, such as paying your taxes on the loan, uh, keeping up with farm insurance on the property, things of that nature. So when you borrow money to fund your poultry farm, you're tying the collateral that you offer up to the financial health of your poultry farm. And your collateral is at risk to the financial problems of your poultry farm. So for example, we talked about personal homes may be used as collateral. So you would be tying your personal home to your poultry farm. And if you default on your poultry loan, you may be required to forfeit your personal home. So that's something very important to consider before offering up your personal home as collateral. Okay, so it's important that you know your contract before you borrow for it. Now this is your contract with your integrator, your poultry contract. And here are some questions that you should ask about your contract before borrowing money against it. What is the length of your contract? Is it flock to flock? So, for example, do you have a three-year flock-to-flock contract? What does that mean? Does that mean that you're only going to receive, uh, you're only guaranteed to receive birds on a flock-to-flock -flock basis, meaning that they can terminate your contract anytime within the three years, or are you guaranteed to receive X number of flocks per year within that three years? That's all going to be contained in your contract. Also, what are the rights um, with your company if your term, if your contract is terminated? Uh, what are the reasons that your contract could be terminated? Uh, often there will be language in your contract that outlines uh, how and why your contract may be terminated. Uh, how does your company handle housing upgrades? How are disputes handled by your company? Uh, those should all be included in there. Uh, typically speaking, contracts may include language uh, that says upgrades can be um, required kind of at will by the company so they make the determination when an upgrade is required. Uh, it's important that you understand how you're paid. Uh, do you Does your contract include any guaranteed pay? Or are you ranked in a tournament? And then um, is your density, your flock numbers, your target weight, everything related to your flock of birds guaranteed in your contract? Uh, does the company have the ability to change your density or change your target weight? Um, without notifying you or do they have to notify you how much time do they uh, are they required to notify you by questions like this and many more are going to be found in our copy of the uh, FSA guide and that's going to be in appendix C all right so tournament pay and your mortgage payment so just so that everyone understands tournament pay is an incentive that's used by integrators to encourage peak performance amongst their contract farmers and how it works is that under this model farms with flocks being processed during the same week are ranked amongst each other according to integrator cost per pound and that becomes your tournament. Once your tournament is established farmers performance are rated above or below the average and that determines their end pay. Um, so farmers that are underperforming the average will have their pay reduced meaning Farmers who have a higher cost to the company will be lower ranked, ranked below the average, and will have their pay reduced. While farmers that produce cheaper than the company average will be ranked higher and will have a bonus added to their pay. This means that your pay can fluctuate greatly from one flock to the next, whereas your cost, specifically your mortgage payment, your loan payment, will remain the same regardless of what you're being paid. So it's essential to consider that the average pay estimate may not be representative of what your actual pay will be. You could earn higher, but you could also earn lower. So it's always good to estimate your cash flow and be very realistic on how you estimate your cash flow. Um, here in this slide, you'll see that we have some company estimates listed on the right and some farmer estimates listed on the left. So you'll notice that the estimated cost of building four houses is 
the same, $966,000. The estimated gross income is the same, roughly $164,000. The estimated loan payment is the same, uh, about $94,000 and change, whereas the estimated farmer costs are much different. The company estimates $36,000, whereas farmers that we consulted with and our current poultry farmers estimate closer to $80,000. So how is this different and why is it different? Well, the expenses that the company lists are listed on the left, and the expenses that our farmers have included are listed on the right. Now, just so that everyone understands, every cost that the company estimates here, um, farmers also do include. But there are additional costs that the farmers have included that they know they have to pay based on their own experience. And all of these figures can be found in our guide as well. Um, you can refer to Section C for many more um, cash flow estimates just to give you a better um, idea of things. But you'll notice that we've included the electric bill, the insurance bill, the bill for cleaning out, the bill for crust out, the property taxes, and that totals down to $36,400. But in that, there's additional costs, for example, heating fuel, the cost to fill your house with shavings, especially if this is a new poultry operation or you've had to do a clean out down to a the bare ground. Um, you also have equipment fuel for um, fueling your generators or maybe your digesters or something like that that you have around the uh, property. Equipment repairs, this could be to any of your equipment necessary to run the operation like a cake out machine or something like that. And then you also have hired labor in there. Most farmers that we talk to do have at least one hired person on hand. Um, to help them with their operation and that's where the difference is and so you can you know compare and contrast these two different cost analysis cool. okay so now we're going to discuss basic FSA loan eligibility so these are the steps to do before you've applied so before applying you need to seek financing with traditional lenders FSA eligibility process starts with exploring financing option with traditional lenders like farm credit, a bank, or a credit union. If you are unable to secure financing at reasonable rates and terms, then you may be eligible for um, an FSA loan. So, of course, you have to start by first applying to farm credit before applying directly to FSA. Now, to get started with an FSA application, you need to first have your farm number. So to be considered for a loan, you must demonstrate you are authorized to operate your farm where it is located. So you would visit your local FSA office with a copy of your lease, your rental agreement, or proof of ownership, and then they would assist you in registering and receiving your FSA farm number. There are a couple conditions with this. For certain FSA loans, your loan officer may require that you complete a borrower training course within two years of closing the loan. Uh, your loan funds must be used within the United States. And then certain loan requirements uh, may exceed the lending limits of FSA. In that case, you, the borrower, must be able to secure the remaining financing from another source. So, for example, if the FSA loan limit on a particular program is $300,000 and you need $400,000, you would need to secure the additional $100,000 from a separate lender, not FSA. Okay, so here are some different uh, notes on FSA loans. One is the 150% rule. So on all direct FSA loans uh, have a security requirement of at least 100% of the loan amount. However, FSA will require applicants to provide collateral up to 150% of the loan amount if it is available. And this, loan, uh, this rule specifically applies to FSA direct loans only. So for example, if you're borrowing $300,000 to upgrade your poultry farm, you may be required uh, to offer an additional $150,000 in collateral, meaning your poultry farm and other collateral like your equipment or personal home could be required as collateral. There are some exceptions to the 150% rule. For example, if the asset necessary like your tractor, other equipment, um, chattel like other type of breeding stock or cattle, something like that, if those are necessary to secure credit elsewhere for farming operations, they may be accepted. Uh, also, your personal home, your household contents, your personal vehicles, 
They can also be exempt from the 150% rule. However, your home must be on a separate parcel of land. So if your home is on the exact same parcel as your farm, then it may not be exempt. Um, also, working capital accounts like your bank account and uh, retirement accounts like your 401k, pensions, those may also be exempt. Um, for guaranteed loans, FSA reviews the collateral proposed and available and requires the lender sec to secure the loan to the satisfaction of both FSA and the lender. Um, Benny, would you like to speak on that a little bit more? Does that mean that they have a little more flexibility with how much collateral is required for a guaranteed loan? The lender is, the lender is uh, advised and able to use what they would do to another applicant that is not guaranteed. And so that sometimes goes beyond what FSA's requirements are. And so that's where the flexibility comes in. Excellent. So in that particular case, as Benny said, um, your individual lender may have additional flexibility. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. Okay. So here are some basic types of farm loans that are available from FSA. There are other type of loans, but we're only going to discuss these three because these are the three primary ones that most people use. Again, you have a farm ownership loan like we discussed. Those may only be used to buy or enlarge a farm make a down payment on a farm, make structure improvements on a farm, like building a building or structure or something of that nature, or other brick and mortar projects. Now you have an operating loan, and that's a loan to cover necessary expenses associated with improving the profitability of your farm. According to the FSA description, an operating loan will help you purchase livestock and equipment and pay for minor real estate repairs and annual operating expenses. You also have an emergency loan, and that, according to the FSA description, is a loan that will help you if you suffered a qualifying loss caused by a natural disaster that damaged your farming or ranching operation. You can find more details on these three most common types of loan uh, in, included in the FSA guide, or you're welcome to contact your local FSA office also. Um, there's also conservation loans, micro loans, and other types of loans, but again, um, it's best to contact your local FSA office if you have additional questions about those types of loans. All right, so we're going to discuss eligibility for direct loans. So under direct loan, you have a farm ownership loan, you have an operating loan, you have an emergency loan, all three of the types of loans we discussed previously. But your loan limit is $300,000. And if we remember from earlier, this is the type of loan where FSA is the one directly loaning you $300,000, and they're also the one that will be servicing that $300,000. So your general eligibility requirements are um, have the training, education, or experience to effectively manage a farm or ranch. You must be a U.S. citizen, a non-citizen national, or a qualified alien. You must possess the legal capacity to obtain a loan. You must not have a conviction related to a controlled substance. You must be unable to obtain credit elsewhere at reasonable rates and terms. If you remember a few slides back, we mentioned that you first need to start by applying for financing with a uh, non-FSA lender. And then if you're unable to find those reasonable rates and terms, that's when you would turn to FSA. So that's what that eligibility requirement means. Also, you must be able to demonstrate good credit history or if you're unable to demonstrate good credit history. You need to show that, that, that the incidences were, be, uh, were due to circumstances beyond your control, they were infrequent, or they were not recent. You must not have had a recent foreclosure or business failure. You must be able to show that your farm is a family farm or ranch, and the majority of the physical labor and management is provided by you, a family member, or another entity member. You must not have received debt forgiveness on another FSA direct or guaranteed loan. And you must not be behind on any debt to the government when the loan closes, with certain exceptions. Uh, if you have questions about those exceptions, please contact your local FSA agent. Okay, so now we're going to discuss eligibility for guaranteed loans. So under a guaranteed loan, we have farm ownership loans, we have operating loans, we have conservation loans, and the loan limit for that is generally $1,399,000. That's adjusted annually. So for example, it went up from 2016, 
but it may be adjusted you know, down in 2018. So that's always something to check on with your local FSA agent. So the eligibility requirements for a guaranteed loan are that you are a U.S. citizen, a non-citizen national, or a qualified alien. You must possess the legal capacity to obtain a loan. You are unable to find a lender willing to approve your loan with reasonable terms and rates without a guarantee. Uh, you must not have received debt forgiveness on another FSA direct or guaranteed loan. You must be able to show that your farm is a family farm or ranch, and the majority of the physical labor and management is provided by you, a family member, or another entity member. And you must not be behind on any debt owed to the U.S. government after the loan closes. Um, there's also some additional um, security requirements on FSA guaranteed loans. So in some cases, if you use chattel as a security on more than one loan for a guaranteed loan, uh, you may be able to do so for a guaranteed loan, but you would need to consult your individual lender if that's an option for you. So for example, um, you may be able to use breeding stock or equipment across as collateral across two different loans. Uh, Benny, can you think of a situation where that may apply, sir? That would apply if you're... Oh, just a sec. Agreed. This, you can use, uh, your chattels can be, if you were getting for two loans, uh, you needed a operating loan and you needed an ownership loan. Your chattels actually can be used as collateral in both instances. Okay. Excellent. Let's see. So, we want you to understand your loan terms. In order to do that, you need to understand the terminology used in loans. So for example, when we say loan terms, we mean the number of payments, the interest rate, and obligations stipulated by your loan agreement. Your interest rate is the proportion of a loan charged as interest to you, the borrower. The interest is the money paid regularly at a particular rate for money lent or for delaying the repayment of debt. And this may be fixed or floating. A fixed interest rate is an interest rate that remains the same throughout the life of the loan, whereas a floating interest rate is an interest rate that is subject to change over the life of the loan, and that's also known as a variable interest rate. So most of you have probably heard of fixed interest rates and variable interest rates. Now, a floating interest rate may be initially lower than a fixed rate, but could increase over time. And that could have significant consequences for you repaying your loan, i.e. a much higher loan payment in the future. Uh, longer terms will lower your monthly payment amount, but they will result in more interest being paid over the life of the loan. So while having longer terms will increase your ability to pay on a monthly basis by having a lower, term, uh, lower payment amount, you will overall end up repaying more for that loan because you've stretched your terms out over a longer time. It's critically important that you discuss these loan terms and rates with your FSA or your loan officer to select the option that works best for you. And you should consider how your loan terms will affect your ability um, to repay your loan um, as well as affect what your monthly loan payment will be. So, loan terms and lenders which are best for you so we I wanted to discuss balloon loans and payments because a lot of times those come into play with poultry loans so in a balloon loan your initial terms for the loan typically the first three years have a relatively manageable payment and fixed interest rate however after the initial three period the loan will become due in one very large balloon payment hence the name for you know this type of loan if you're unable to make the balloon payment, then your lender may renew your loan for another balloon loan, which would reset your loan terms with a new interest rate and will include some fees. However, there is no guarantee that your lender will renew your loan after the balloon payment is due. Balloon loans are riskier are a riskier repayment option. So just because you know they have renewed your loan once or twice before does not mean that they will renew it a third time. And there's no obligation for them to renew that loan. Um, there's no obligation for them to give you the same terms as in your previous balloon note 
So just keep that in mind when you're considering whether or not you want to take a balloon loan uh, out on your poultry farm. Now, for, FSA, uh, for guaranteed loans, the lender's FSA ranking will influence their application process. So under the FSA lender rankings, you have three different rankings. A preferred lender is the highest uh, FSA ranked lender and therefore has the most flexibility in their application process. This means they may not require you to um, go through some of the um, initial application stages that other lenders would have you uh, be required to do so. So a certified lender is the second highest FSA ranked uh, lender and has more flexibility in their application process than a standard lender but less than a preferred lender. And then standard is the basic FSA ranking and has the least flexibility in their application process. Um, again, your local FSA office can uh, provide a complete list of uh, lenders as well as their FSA uh, lender ranking. So the FSA loan application process. The application process we've broken down into 10 general steps. Uh, the first one would be to obtain a contract or letter of intent from your integrator. Um, if you're not going to, you know, if you're not going to get a, com a contract from your company, there's no reason to apply for financing. You then need to consult your company for the proposed housing layout. Generally, your company knows where they want houses to be laid out on your land, and they have a very specific idea of it, and they'll tell you right away. That's important for your environmental pre-screen or assessment. So depending on where your houses are going, that's going to affect if you need to do a pre-screen or an assessment. It's also going to affect whether you need to do a historic preservation pre-screen or assessment, and then uh, whether or not you need to do fish and wildlife review or not. Uh, now, all poultry farmers will be required to submit a concert comprehensive nutrient management plan, otherwise known as a waste management plan. Uh, you're also going to need to submit a plan for your repayment ability and your farm operating plan. That's essentially your farm business plan, demonstrating how you're going to repay the proposed amounts that you are refunding. Um, you also need to submit your security requirement. So that's going to be what your collateral will be worth uh, and what collateral you are submitting. So generally speaking, that would be a property uh, assessment, something like that. And then you'll go through the approval process. That's once all your applications have been submitted, all documentation. Now FSA has your complete application and they'll review it. And we're going to go on next to what to do if your application is denied or changed. Okay, so first we'll cover what to do if your loan is denied or changed. Because if your loan is approved, you move forward with construction and getting into poultry. That is pretty straightforward. Now, if your loan is denied, you may appeal the decision. It's important to note that decisions may be appealed, but not regulations. Benny, do you want to talk and uh, talk, speak on that, sir, and distinguish what does it mean when we say that your decision may not be appealed, or your decision may be appealed, but not the regulations? What the, what the rules say is that any adverse decision is appealed, and even though... FSA said, may send you a letter that says it's not appealable. That is an adverse decision and in itself is appealable. But in the appeal process, you have to argue from what the rules say. You can't argue that the rules are wrong. And when we say the rules, we're specifically saying rules from the Federal Register or the statute. There are interpretations from their own, the agency interpretation of what the rules say is what we have to argue. So let's discuss just an eligibility requirement that was pretty straightforward uh, that may kind of sum this up. For example, if you put in an, an FSA application and you are denied because you are not a U.S. citizen and you are not a legal resident, uh, you're here on a visa, something of that nature, and therefore you are ineligible to receive this financing. Now, you would not be able to appeal that decision because the, regu the regulation states that you are ineligible. Is that, that, that? That is correct. And what you run into that is, is most 
of the time that would come in is that you would argue you were trying to argue that you didn't every decision will have a time specification on it that's going to reply mm -hmm. and if it says 30 days that's from a regulation mm -hmm. and missing that terminates your eligibility and that's in the the rules so you that's a regulation you can't you can't change they they can't change that i'm glad you brought that up benny because that uh segues to what we were going to talk about next is what are the steps if you want to appeal your decision and as benny already mentioned those will be time bound so the first one is you may request a reconsideration meeting however you have to make that request within 30 days of receiving your decision letter now at a reconsideration meeting they will look at the decision again and possibly reconsider it. Hence, it's a reconsideration meeting. Here, you would present information to explain why you believe the decision was made in error. To our earlier example, if, for example, um, you know you were denied because you're not a U.S. citizen, but you are a legal U.S. alien, well, you can appeal that and you can say, well, I thought that I should be eligible because I am a legal U.S. alien and it says that I am eligible for the loan. Um, and then the denying uh, loan officer would you know, argue their case on why they denied the file. So you can present information as to why something was made in error. Correct. And, and that goes back to the 30 days also. What the appeals NAD is the National Appeals Division is the, the agency that uh, handles our appeals. If they will consider, the letter will say when you receive, they will, they will allow up to seven days normally for mailing. Hmm. And so, you know, but you have to, when you appeal, you have to put the day that you received it. They calculate the days that from that, you know, for that 30 mm -hmm. days, mm -hmm. and that's where it becomes you know, regulatory. So it's very important that you ensure that you're moving on a, any type of denial appeal in a very timely manner and that you also keep track of when mailings were received and when mailings were sent off and when you applied for things. So if your decision at your reconsideration meeting does not change, then you have an additional 30 days to request either mediation or to appeal the FSA decision. You may only request mediation or appeal the decision, not both. And you only have 30 days. So if you request mediation, a neutral mediator will help the two parties review the options and agree on a solution. Now, if you appeal your decision, that is where you will appeal to NAD, the National Appeal Division, as uh, Benny mentioned. And your appeal must be postmarked no later than 30 days following your decision letter. So that is your decision letter from your reconsideration meeting, not your original uh, decision letter. That appeal would be mailed off to National Appeal Division at the address provided here in Court Over, Tennessee. Now, more options, uh, sorry, more detailed information would be available in the guide uh, as well as from your local FSA office. And, and an important to remember here is that your clock stops, your 30 day clock stops when you apply for the uh, mediation, but it immediately kicks in when that mediation concludes. So you don't have an additional 30 days after mediation. It's just the time remaining in that 30 days from when you originally applied for mediation. Excellent. Thank you. Um, also, if you find yourself in this situation, uh, please feel free to reach out to a farmer uh, aid organization or a farmer advocacy organization. Um, you can contact us directly at RAFI. Um, our contact information will be listed at the end of the presentation, but there also may be other organizations in your uh, local region which may be better equipped to assist you. Okay. So, an important part of your loan is fulfilling your loan obligations. This entire time we've been talking about um, doing personal assessment before applying and what the application process is like. But for most of you, you're going to be spending most of your loan life in refilling, uh, sorry, fulfilling your loan obligations. This means that you have been approved for financing, you receive the loan, 
Now it's time to repay it. So depending on the type of loan, um, you're going to have different responsibilities during the life of that loan. Of course, you have to make sure that you're still making your payments on time and that you're making them in the specified amount. But failing to fulfill a loan obligation could lead to a defaulture, either monetary or non-monetary. And that could result in foreclosure or FSA repossessing the loan collateral. So some of the co common borrower obligations are paying any fees required by FSA for a lien search, uh, executing loan documents, filing or recording financial statements, credit checks, any other kind of fees, maintaining and protecting your collateral. This is an important one for poultry farmers because your poultry houses are your collateral. A lot of times farmers may think, well, I have four poultry houses. Uh, I'd like to close down to three where it's more manageable, and then I will sell off the fourth one for scrap metal. If you do that, if you change or alter your collateral without prior authorization from FSA or your lender, you could be found in non-monetary default. That also includes if your, your farm is used as collateral and there is timber on your farm. Cutting the timber without receiving prior authorization could lead to a non-monetary default. So make sure that you review your loan documents, review your collateral agreement, and consult your loan officer before you do anything like that. Uh, another issue that we see lots of farmers running into, paying any and all taxes on your property or security. Sometimes some guys will let the taxes slide for a little bit and come back and try and pay them. But if you don't pay your taxes, you may be in non-monetary default, and they may be able to foreclose on your farm as a result. Another issue is maintaining insurance company on uh, as specified in your FSA loan agreement. So you may be required to maintain insurance on your farm, your poultry houses, uh, farming equipment. That may be a certain type of insurance, which meets their uh, specifications or any of their requirements. Yeah, that's good because it, it says you would you would insure it at the collateral value because you're protecting the insurance protecting the collateral. So the, the requirement is that you maintain insurance that would replace the value of that collateral. Mm -hmm. And so a good example of that is uh, maintaining insurance on your poultry houses. Um, we have seen poultry houses burned down before due to electrical fires or lightning, any number of reasons. And so if you don't have insurance that will insure that poultry house to the collateral value, then you may be in non-monetary default because you're going to be under collateralized on that loan going forward. So just keep in mind, it is your responsibility to fulfill the loan obligations. It's also your responsibility to you know, uh, maintain all the other obligations within the loan, such as any check-ins, site inspection, or providing any required documentation. If your loan, for example, states that you are required to provide documentation proving your insurance, but you haven't done so, you could be in non-monetary default, even if you have insurance. And that's because you did not follow through and provide the insurance as you were required to do. So again, your loan officer or your FSA agent can answer additional questions about this if you have any, and please feel free to ask them also. Okay, so trouble repaying your loan, restructuring. None of us ever want to get to this point, but we know it happens, and we know what happens in farming, especially in poultry farming. Sometimes you're not able to meet your financial obligations. So what do you do if you know that you can't make your mortgage payment? First, if you're having trouble meeting all of your financial obligations, that includes everything, not just your poultry loan, but your poultry loan, your personal loans, your home mortgage, your vehicle loans, that kind of thing, Cons uh, consult your FSA office as soon as possible to seek counseling. It's best to do it before you have missed any payments because you will have many more options available to you than after you have missed a payment. And if you cannot fulfill all of your debt obligations, then you want to go ahead and start contacting uh, those creditors, both for farm and personal uh, debts. So, to check your eligibility for loan restructuring or more restructuring details, you would contact your lender. If you have a direct loan, then FSA is your lender. If you have a guaranteed loan, then contact the commercial lender, uh, your farm credit, 
your local bank, whomever is servicing your loan. Uh, you may need to request a meeting between FSA, your lender, and yourself. And just keep in mind that not all of these restructuring programs will be available to your particular situation. But types of restructuring include consolidation, rescheduling, deferment, an interest rate reduction, a write-down, or a conservation contract. Also, you may con contact a farmer advocate for financial counseling, like someone uh, here at RAFI, either myself or Benny, um, or another organization who may be working in your state. So, uh, if you are unable to repay your loan on time, you may default. If your loan is fully collateralized, then the bank or FSA will initiate foreclosure or liquidation proceedings. From the time you receive the first default notice, you will have a specified amount of time before foreclosure or liquidation will start. That default notice will explicitly state how much time you have or it will give you a date in the future to uh, resolve the issues be before that date. Uh, if you receive a default notice, please contact an attorney as soon as possible to understand your rights. Um, if your available securities have been liquidated and there is still debt remaining, you may be able to seek a debt settlement agreement. A debt settlement is a negotiating an agreement between you and your lender to reduce the overall debt in exchange for a lump sum payment. So some important um, persons to contact as you're working through farming, as you're looking for FSA loans, or as uh, you may find that you are in financial distress, anything of that nature. You know, contact your local FSA office uh, for lending policy or, you know, for general questions. You can find your state offices listed at the website here, fsa.usda.gov slash state offices. Uh, North Carolina specific offices may be found at the link below. Um, if you're a farmer in need of financial counseling, please feel free to contact Raffi. Our website uh, for contract agriculture can be found here. We work um, mostly with contract poultry farmers. Or you can contact myself or Mr. Benny Bunting directly. Uh, Benny is our lead farmer advocate. Uh, his telephone number as well as email are found here. Uh, I myself, Tyler Whitley, am the uh, contract agriculture case manager. And my contact information and email can be found here as well. Um, we want to take this time to thank you for uh, viewing our presentation and feel free to contact us or your local FSA office if you should have any questions.